You can just type in the chat if you can. And can you hear me as well? Okay, great. So I'm I'm gonna does the chat can you see the chat box at all? Is it like obscuring your view at all? Okay, so hopefully this shouldn't hide too much. And so we're gonna start. So basically, um today we're gonna be going over evolution and which is kind of important because like we literally have all originally from evolution. So a lot um a lot of scientists believe that every living being has originated from a common ancestor and then evolution, like um the environment we live in and the changes that have uh, occurred to that environment. Um uh allowed us to change and adapt to those characteristics it's not that we consciously evolved as you'll see later but it's more of a sort of survival of the fittest thing which um i'm sure you've heard of before so let's move on to the next slide if it'll let me oh here it is okay so we're gonna pres so darwin charles darwin the scientist we'll be talking about today wrote a book called the origin of species which detailed his um theory about uh, natural selection, which before hadn't really been heard of about, but like around his, um, around his around his time frame, a lot of people were like thinking about how humans originated and how other species originated as well. So previously, um, so for a little bit of background uh, information, so a theory is a well supported explanation for a phenomena of the natural world. It's not use the same way in science as it is in our general world so it's more um it's more like a it's more like an argument or a claim that you might write in a research paper rather than um like an idea you have in a conversation with a friend if that makes sense so uh, these are just a uh, a couple of different pieces of evidence that support darwin's theory like darwin's finches um artificial selection um drug resistant bacteria and homologous and analogous structures so throughout the entire lecture i want you to guys to be thinking um would you believe darwin's theory so i'm not going to be telling you so much as why you should believe it rather than just presenting the evidence for why i think it is and why many other people think it is so yeah just think about that idea so darwin defined evolution as um quote unquote descent with modification so it's basically um, so all species are descendants of other ancestral species that are different from their present day counterparts. And evolution can also be defined as a change in genetic composition, which comes as comes with a time of natural selection. And evolution can be uh, viewed in two different ways, patterns and processes. So patterns are through, they're more of like the more sciencey thing stereotypically sciencey things you tend to think about. There are data from biology, geology, physics, and chemistry that provide like graphs and statistics to show exactly why we have, not why, but like show that we have change and that it's a fact. And the process is more like theoretical. It's more of a mechanism that causes evolution and shows more of a logical change that shows how it happens. Yeah, where's the sound on this? Oh, you have your thing on. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who this is because I can't see the Zoom screen right now. But um, I think somebody has their microphone on. So if you could turn it off, that'd be helpful. What happened to your sound? Can you, can you fix this? Is your bike on? No, your mic is not on. Um, hold on. Do you guys hear that? Can you type in the chat real quick? Is there like someone in the background or am I going crazy? Okay, so it seems to have stopped. So I think they figured out their are Or not. So I'm going to pause Today's my share and see what's going on. Oh, we'll get right back into the lecture. Right, Sorry, you couldn't notice. There is volume. 
There is volume. It is volume. And what your is mic's it? on if you didn't know this, dude. Well, middle. Your mic's on, dude. Mic's on? Your mic's on. Your mic's on. Your mic's on. Turn your mic on. Are, are you saying stuff? Something. Um, oh, whatever. Okay. So, um, whoever that is, could you, um, your microphone is indeed on. Uh, I can hear you. Um, it's, um, so if you could figure that out real quick, that'd be helpful. Okay. I can't really see anything because I have no idea how screen sharing works. So, seems to have stopped. So They're muted time. now. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so this is a little bit of history on the topic before Darwin proposed his hypothesis. So Aristotle, um, he was a famous philosopher, Greek philosopher, who lived from 384 to 322 uh, to BCE or BC, which you might be fam more familiar with. Um, they he viewed species as unchanging, but he did notice similar similarities between different organisms and created the scala naturae, which is like a ladder that shows um the different like phases of evolution almost like um development and then so scientists in the 1700s um um more like combined religion with science so they had ideas similar to those of the old testament and they proposed like oh um because each organism is so well adapted to their environment this must mean that there's a creator that created them that way so then they match the environment well so one of the earliest scientists that had started developing different ideas about evolution was Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, um, who lived from 1744 to 1829 um, CE or Common Era. So he noticed the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So, and he believed in um, a sort of theory of use and disuse. So for giraffes, for example, he thought, oh, so their necks are so long. And he wondered, he noticed that giraffes necks were really long and he wanted to know why that was. So he proposed the idea that giraffes, when giraffes try to eat, tries to eat higher leaves on the trees, they stretch their necks longer um, in order to be able to reach the higher leaves. And over time, this caused their necks to stretch out longer. And um, generations after them kept on being born with longer necks. He also believed organisms had an innate drive to be more complex, which is another, which he thought was another reason field evolution. However, there are like a couple of flaws with this theory that I can think of. Um, uh, could you type why you might think this is in the chat? Yes, that's true. It is, it is in fact not in their genes, which and genetics was a theory. Um, wasn't theory. Genetics was something that they discovered later, so he didn't really have any idea about this. But the point is, if like, <laughs> that's funny. Violinist children are not automatically violinists. Yes, that's true. So like, if Dwayne the Rock Johnson had a child, they wouldn't be born like super muscular and like looking like him, would they? So that, although they didn't know what genetics was. The fact was that if you have a child, they're not going to inherit the characteristics that you acquired throughout your life, which is why Lamarck's theory, although a good start, was false. So now we get to the story of Charles Darwin, who we're gonna, whose theory we'll be talking about for the rest of the lecture. So he actually was studying, he came from a very rich, he came from a pretty rich family. And he was actually studying to become a Prius, but eventually because his father thought he didn't really have, it was either a priest or, he was suddenly to be a priest or a doctor. But um, ever since he was a kid, he was really interested in naturalism, but his father thought that wasn't, that wasn't like a viable, a viable career for him and wouldn't make him any money. But eventually he did become a naturalist. So he embarked from England on the HMS Beagle and he visited the Galapagos, uh, Galapagos Islands. So the Galapagos Islands are a group of islands they're located approximately 900 kilometers west off the coast of South America. And there he found the famous Galapagos finches. 
So this was what really kickstarted his foray into evolution. Um, it's what caused him to start thinking about his theory a lot. So the finches were, so because these were a series of islands, right? Each of them were separated from, each of the islands were separated from each other and had different environments. So there are also finches on each of these islands, but they had like small differences. They clearly had um, originated from a common ancestor, but they had different features that made them more well adjusted to their home islands. So one of these features were their beaks, which helped them eat, um, which helped them eat a specific food source that was plentiful on their island. So being separated by their respective islands forced them to evolve certain features to better survive. So the development of those, so this caused Darwin to develop his explanation of natural selection, which was that inherited traits survive because of those traits. Um, and traits are caused by gen genetic mutations rather than the will of those organisms. So it's not that um, uh, an organ, let's say a finch was like living on an island that had, grew a lot of cacti and they wanted to eat those cacti in order to um, survive better than other finches. It's not that the finches consciously thought that they were going to start developing better beaks to eat those cactuses, cacti. It's just that if there was a finch that had like a stronger beak that was better at getting through the cactus's tough skin, as opposed to a finch with a weaker beak, then the finch with a stronger beak would be more likely to survive because they had the um, because they had the quality that allowed them to survive. And then they would have children with other finches, which would allow them to pass on their traits that allowed them to survive. So these inherited tra traits survive because of those traits, because those traits allowed them to, uh, allowed them to adapt to their environment better than other people's. So it's not, evolution is a little bit of a misleading term because it implies that they were trying to consciously involve rather than survival the fittest, which is another more popular way of referring to it, because the like it's a good way to summarize it. Like literally, the fit, fittest survive. So again, Darwin didn't know that much about genetics. No one did at the time, but later when genetics were discovered, um, they strongly supported this theory. So now we get to finches. Um, so like I said, there's a certain species of the cactus finch, Geospizes scandens, that uses its beak to tear out uh, and eat cactus pulp. And the green warbler finch uses its beak to eat insects and the large ground finch uses its beak to crack open large seeds. So these are all found on different islands where their respective food sources are available. So does this seem like a coincidence to you? Well, actually, I. This, these slides were originally meant to be in a different order. So I should have asked that question before, but it's fine. So now we get to artificial selection. So humans have modified many species through a process called artificial selection. So it's where all of our food comes from. Um, like for example, corn. Um, the corn plant as we know it with like its large seeds and like, uh, and like how easy it is to chew didn't always exist like that. The thing is humans, we bred organisms with desired characteristics uh, de desired characteristics together, which exaggerated certain traits by continuously bringing out the strongest of each trait. So for example, the wild mustard plant um, was artificially selected into cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, etc. So cabbage was selected for its leaves. Um, Brussels sprouts were selected for like the small, the small buds that grew on the side of the plant and um, so on. So Darwin argued that the same process occurs in nature, but humans aren't the ones selecting it. His observations were that members of a population vary in their inherited traits, um, which leads us back to genetics, which he, they had, uh, he didn't really know about, but, and all species produce more offspring than their environment can support. And many of these offsprings fail to survive and reproduce. So, um, um, from, these two observations, he inferred that individuals who had these inherited traits, these traits gave them a better chance of surviving and therefore reproducing in a certain environment. And this allowed them to leave off more offspring than other people, uh, other organisms, sorry. So this unequal ability to produce leads to accumulation of favorable traits over generations. So this, a picture, the picture you see on the right of the screen is the puffball mushroom, which produces billions of spores. 
So all of, if all of those grew to maturity, they would absolutely cover like the forest floor and it just simply wouldn't be habitable. However, the thing is from those spores, only a very, very small fraction actually make it to development. And other organisms, they can be starved, eaten, diseased, unmated, or just simply ill-adjusted to their environments. If like um an organism, if an organism like an organism that lives in water might be ill-adjusted to the salinity of the water. So because of that, organisms reproduce over reproduce to ensure that the probability of them leaving behind the required, well not required, but like ideal amount of, of offspring is higher. So now we're going to talk about drug resistant bacteria. So um have any of you guys heard about this like on the news or like just in general from your parents? You can type in chat. Yeah, super bugs, exactly. Um, so it's like a relatively simple concept. So we're going to be talking about the evolution of methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus or MRSA as I'll um, abbreviate it later. So penicillin was invented by, well, not invented, but discovered by Alexander Fleming um, early on, but it was first um, in widespread use in 1943. So this saved millions of lives because people often died of bacterial infections before then. So when you get like a cut or you get like strep throat, you take antibiotics to make to kill the bacteria there, so to make sure it doesn't get infected and it doesn't harm your immune um, it doesn't harm your body. However, back then they had to rely on their immune system to get rid of this. So obviously, because they didn't have a reliable medication to help kill these bacteria, they had to um, they had to just tough it out and see what see what fate would bring them. Oh, um, I feel like this is a good time to mention the difference between bacteria and viruses. So bacteria are like living things. Viruses are technically not classified as living, but they have some qualities of a living or a living organism, but they are not made of cells. So they're largely considered by many not to actually be living. So back, um, antibiotics only work on bacteria. So although viruses have evolved through nat natural selection, that's not what we're talking about today. So those are two different things. Um, anyway, in 1945, um, about 20% how of uh, Staphylococcus aureus strains were resistant to penicillin in hospitals. And this is because they developed an enzyme, penicillinase, that destroyed penicillin and protected them. So think about it. If these bacteria were constantly in an environment that exposed them to penicillin, which is like a type of mold that destroys bacteria, that means they obviously, the bacteria that did survive would reproduce and pass their traits um, in this case, it's the ability to produce penicillinase, penicillinase that would, um, and they would pass this down to their offspring. And because these offspring had it, this trait would um, become increasingly concentrated and stronger, and it would allow them to better survive in an environment where they are exposed to penicillin. So in 1958, they developed methicillin, which deactivates an enzyme used to synthesize cell walls and bacteria. So this works for a little while um, because the bacteria, again, weren't, they weren't used to it. They first had to develop uh, resistance to methicillin through natural selection. However, in about two years, Staphylococcus aureus became resistant to methicillin as well. And many MRSA strains were, and many MRSA strains are also resistant to other types of antibiotics. So the, the key takeaways you can find from this are that is that again, natural selection selects, it doesn't create. So it'll select for the, the traits that allow them to survive. The bacteria in this case, the ones that had the ability to produce penicillinase were the ones that were able to survive and therefore reproduce, which is why there were more bacteria with penicillinase. It wasn't that the bacteria noticed that there were penicillinase and reacted in this way. In addition, times, the time span of natural selection varies drastically. So normally when you think about evolution, you think about it, it happens over like a long time, right? Or like over decades, hundreds, even millions of years for organisms to adapt. However, the case of MRSA um, shows that it can happen in just a few years as well, showing that it's like very versatile um, and it's not, it's not a time limited phenomena if you get my drift. So um, 
Another good example of evidence for evolution is the difference between, oh, someone has sent an article I haven't noticed, but yes, that's basically what I want to um, So homologous structures and analogous structures. So what do these two words mean? So first we're going to go over homologous structures. So homology is the similarity between different characteristics resulting from common ancestry, but they don't necessarily have the same function. So that's like a lot, so I'm gonna break it down. So we as humans, for example, have our arm. It's consists of a humerus, a radius, a humerus in your upper arm, a radius and an ulna in your forearm, and then carpals at the base of your hand. And I'm not familiar with the bones of the fingers actually, but um, yeah, your fingers. However, in a whale, we see these same exact bones. We see a humerus, versions of a radius and an ulna, um, and carpals. So think about it. So if you had just created a whale out of thin air, if you were God and you created a whale, um, you wouldn't really think to put these specific bones inside of their flipper, but for some reason, they do have it. Now, it doesn't serve the same function. For whales, they use it to swim as opposed to humans where they uh, use it to pick up things and um, punch people, etc. So the arrangement of the bones in mammals are pretty much exactly the same. They're not the same bones, but they're arranged similarly if you from the shoulder to the digits. And like I said, they serve similar, sim, uh, different functions. So arms for um, arms and humans, four legs and cats, um, flippers and whales, and the wings and bats are they're all homologous structures and evidence of evolution. So unless natural selection existed, these structures wouldn't be the same. If they had all come from different ancestors, then they would have developed. It's just too much of a coincidence for them to have developed all the all the exact same bones in that arrangement. And yeah, so so yeah, so this implies that they all originate from a common ancestor. And then over time, as they became more well adjusted to their environments, these bones changed to serve different purposes. So, um, so uh, an example of this is vestigial structures. So um, a vestigial structure is something that exists in, within an organism, but it doesn't appear to serve any apparent function. So a lot of the times these originate as a result of natural selection. Their ancestor needed it for something, but over time they gradually evolved and no longer needed it, rendering it useless. So yeah. So in biology, we have this phrase called form, form, follows, uh, form follows function. So unless you have a good reason for it, you won't have something existing unless it has a viable use. So for example, um, under the scales of some blind cavefish, there are remnants of what used to be an eye, and there's vestiges of a pelvis in some snakes. So obviously snakes and blind cavefish, they don't have any use for um, a pelvis or eyes respectively. So, which means that they had to have got, gotten it from somewhere, which is an ancestor that originally had a use for it, but over time was exposed to an environment where they lo no longer needed it and it therefore became a vestigial structure. Oh, um, yeah, by the way, you can ask in questions at any time. I forgot to say this at the beginning, but yeah, if you're confused about anything or need me to re rephrase something I said, because sometimes I know I talk fast or I don't really make sense, so yeah. So um, another good example where we can see homology is in the fossil record. So the uh, Cetaceans, the mammalian order that contains like whales and dolphins and purposes, um, the earliest of these originated around 50 to 60 million years ago. So throughout time, we're able to see, um, get different fossils from different, from different uh, eras of time. So these fossils show the pattern of how they became aquatic. They lost their land limbs and developed flukes and um, yeah. So next we're gonna talk about convergent evolution or which produces analogous structures, like I said previously. So convergent evolution is the independent evolution of similar features in like different lineages. So that means analogous features are the exact opposite of homo uh, 
homo homologous structures. So in analogous structures, they have a similar function, but they originate from a different ancestry. And homologous structures have different function from a similar ancestry. So in homologous structures, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna, although the structures serve very different functions, you're gonna see relatively the same arrangement of bones, um, and you're gonna see, notice the similarities between the two of them. However, in analogous structures, um, it's a different story. So they may look the same on like the outside or they serve like the same function, but they internally, they look completely different. So the sugar glider and the flying, flying squirrel originated from two different ancestors. So I unfortunately don't have a diagram. I couldn't find a good one, but their bone structures are a little bit different. And if you think about this just in general too, it doesn't have to be like a super specific scientific example, um, like birds and insects. So they both fly, but insect wings are vastly different from birds' wings. So does that make sense? All right. So um, to summarize, uh, so natural selection is a process through certain, which certain traits survive and reproduce because of those traits. So organisms, they don't decide to have a certain trait to help them survive. They don't consciously do that. It's just that when they're naturally born with some traits through like small genetic mutations, this allows them to better survive because it makes them better adjusted to their environment and therefore more likely to reproduce. So because of this, it increases the frequency of favorable adaptions in any given environment over time. And an important thing to, important distinction to make is that natural selection causes populations, not individuals to adapt to changes in their environment. So as a whole, you'll see more people, um, not more people, more organisms have like a certain trait, like in the finches, but it's not so that like a certain lineage or a certain family of, not family, family is a misleading term because of the Linnaean, um, like a certain group of organisms that are descended from each other. It causes the entire population to adapt rather than a single one. So as we can, as we've seen, it can not happen over any time, any time span really from many decades, hundreds of years, millions of years to just like literally months or like, like months or a few years. And um, organisms have, organisms um, also, Organisms are also modified by humans through artificial selection, which we do for our crops all the time to increase um, the quote unquote favorable characteristics that like we want to eat. And the same process is mirrored through that in nature. And then homologous and analogous structures, um, we can learn a lot through, about evolution through the anatomy of creatures. So homologous structures, well, I just went over this, but um, in many different organisms, um, that are often parts of like the same, same orders, um, then you'll see that, you'll see that their limbs or their flippers or their wings or whatever, they serve different functions, but they have similar bone arrangements, which implies that they originated from a common ancestor because it's like a really, really big coincidence for them to um, develop the exact same bone structure. Some of the time being, um, sometimes being, um, especially when sometimes, the bones are like useless, like in a whale slippers, you want to, you don't really, they don't really use their digits. And then in analogous structures, um, uh, animals can also, uh, not, not just animals, organisms can also evolve separately to create the same characteristics, which, which also, which is um, also a good way to think about evolution, because it shows that different organisms that come from different lineages might also have to develop the same characteristics, albeit structurally slightly different, in order to um, be, be best adjusted to their environment. Okay, so that was like really quick. I expected that to last a lot longer than it did. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So do you guys have any questions um, at all about what I just went over? Do you guys want me to go over anything again?
Okay, so I'm gonna take that as a no. Um. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I can do that. Give me one moment. So, because I know y'all love this so much, um, well, we're not, we're gonna have a test. Well, we're not really gonna have a test because I'm not that mean, but um, could you guys just like tell me what you learned today and then like give me some feedback? Um, like tell me what parts were like easier to understand, more difficult to understand, because like that would be really helpful for me um, if I, for any future net, uh, lectures. So yeah, just tell me like what you learned, what I think, what you think I could have improved on and stuff like that. Okay, um, so this is my fault. I don't think I was clear enough about this, but um, I didn't mean to say um, most animals have similar bone structures. It's that um, not all animals do, but animals that originate from a common ancestor tend to have similar bone structures because their common ancestor had that bone structure and then they evolve separately from that. So in the chat, I just made a copy and stuff. Um, hold on. So I just sent you a, a link. Um, you should be able to view the presentation through that. So just save it so when the Zoom meeting ends, you'll still be able to access it. Tell me if you can see it. Oh yeah, I see people going there. So if you ever need to like go back and review stuff, um, this will always be there for you if you need it. Oh, go over the first 15 minutes. Um, could you tell me where, could you tell me where you started listening, Alan? Because I'm not sure exactly where the first 15 minutes happened. Okay, start with the mushroom. Okay, so for anyone who's not, for anyone who's, who already listened, okay, don't understand. Okay, so we'll go over all that. So right now I'm gonna review the first 15 minutes for the people who haven't uh, heard it yet. So it's from the beginning to mushrooms. And then, yeah, I'll go over your, uh, I'll go over your question to uh, resource. Um, so if you you can you can leave if you need to or if you want to you can also stay here just chill um i'm cool with both so first i'll share my screen again hold on um Okay, so can I, everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So right now we're gonna go up until the part about uh, the re reproduction of puffball mushrooms, which I think was about the first 15 minutes. 
So um, you guys already know about the format of this lecture, so I don't need to go over that. Um, so the main scientist we talked about today was Darwin. So he defined evolution as descent with modification. So he proposed that all species are descendants of other ancestral species that are different from their present day counterparts. And evolution can also be defined as the change in genetic composition. So it can be viewed through different two different ways, patterns and processes. So a pattern would be like the solid data and statistics that you have for evolution. So this is data from biology, geology, physics, and chemistry. And it sort of shows that life has evolved in like a very number heavy way. And the process is more the logic. So it's the mechanisms that drive evolution and like sort of what you what you think about logically, like why one thing leads to another. So these before Darwin, there were a couple of other people and scientists that um, had their own ideas about evolution. So the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 BCE, or BC, which you might be more familiar with the BC AD system, um, he views species as unchanging. So he noticed similarities between different organisms and but um, he viewed species as unchanging, but he did notice certain similar, similarities between different organisms. And he created the scale of naturae, which was sort of like a ladder rung system for um, like the development and evolution of species. So in the 1700s, a lot of scientists had ideas similar to those of the Old Testament. So they attributed an organism's match their environment to the creator. So what they thought was like, oh, this frog is really, um, this frog is an amphibian, uh, this frog is an amphibian, and they're really good at adjusting to the, the humidity and water levels of their environment. Therefore, God must have created this frog in order to suit this environment. There's also Jean Baptiste de Lamarck, who lived from 1744 to 1829, uh, common era or AD. Um, so he believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So this was more of like a use or disuse type of situation. So for example, he thought giraffes had really long necks because they stretched to eat leaves. So a giraffe was, in order to outcompete their, um, in order to outcompete the other giraffes around them, giraffes had to stretch their necks higher to eat different types of leaves, to eat leaves that were higher on trees. Wait, okay, I need to rephrase that. To eat like the um to eat higher to eat higher leaves on trees. So they had they wanted to eat the leaves that were located above the leaves that other giraffes could eat in order to um have a better source of food. So because because of this, he thought that giraffes constantly stretched their necks in order to be able to eat this, and that caused their necks to become longer, and they passed their long necks to their um uh, to their children. Um, he believed that this was because organisms had an innate drive to be more complex. So there's a very clear problem with this uh, theory, I think, although it's nice um, in thought. So you can just drop in the chat. What, what problem do you think this might have? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so the thing is, um, wait, hold on. I'm just gonna wait for a couple more responses because I don't. Yeah. Okay. So never mind. I'm just. I'll just go over it. So like if. Dwayne the Rock Johnson, for example, had a kid. They wouldn't be born like super muscular, would they? So the thing is, it's although they didn't really know that much about genetics at the time, it just doesn't work that way. You can't pass on an acquired characteristic that you acquired throughout your lifetime consciously without receiving it genetically. So now we get to Charles Darwin, our bestie, and the person we talk about. Oh, use and disuse. So. 
use and disuse was basically he thought that because giraffes stretched their necks and they used it, they um they um grew longer necks. And for disuse, um, his idea was that if a creature stopped using an using a certain trait that they had previously helped them survive, then it would go away. So like if giraffe stops at stretching their necks, then it would shrink back down. Okay, so um so Charles Darwin, um, who proposed the theory of natural selection that we talked about throughout the whole lecture, um, he embarked from he was studying to become either a doctor or a priest because his, although he had a passion for naturalism, his parents didn't really think that was a viable career for him. So he left England on the HMS Beagle and visited the Galapagos Islands. Um, so which was a group of islands located about 900 kilometers west of South America. So this is where he first started to develop theories of natural selection. So he found the Galapagos finches whose beaks and behaviors were adapted to specific foods on their home island. So as you see these three finches, um, the common cactus finch, the green warbler finch, and the large ground fish, finch. Um, they, all, they all live on different islands, but they're all relatively um, similar in ancestry. So because of this, let's say I'm a finch that likes to eat cacti, or no, not, I don't like to eat cacti. I live on an island where there are a lot of cacti. So in order to out-survive the other finches, I have to find a good food source, and a good food source for me is cacti. So if I was naturally born with a stronger, bigger beak that's able to tear into the cactus flesh, I would have a better chance of surviving over another finch that doesn't have such a strong beak and therefore can't eat cacti as well as I do. So because I have a better probability of surviving, I also have a better probability of reproducing and producing more finches that also have a strong beak in order to tear into cacti. So over time, the environment that they're in naturally selects for certain traits that allow them to survive, which is what I mean by saying that inherited traits survive because of those traits. So because all these finches were separated by their respective islands, they evolved certain features to better survive in their different environments. So because of this, traits, um, Darwin proposed that traits are caused by random mutations rather than the will of organisms. So um, another good example of this is ar artificial selection. So a lot of the vegetables we eat these days, um, well, actually all of them pretty much, most vegetables we eat these days are don't naturally grow in the wild like that. We modify these species through a process called artificial selection. So let's say I have a very ancient corn plant and I notice that the corn kernels on this corn plant are bigger than the other one. I'm gonna wanna reproduce the one with bigger kernels so it's easier to chew and there's more food growing. So over time, as I keep on breeding the, the corns with the biggest kernels, the, this trait becomes super exaggerated and I end up with like really, really large pieces of corn. So this is why like if corn, actually in our, um, the variety of corn that most people eat today is actually too big to actually live on its stock, which is why we harvest it early. So um, another good example of this is the wild mustard plant. So we artificially selected cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, and so many other vegetables out of just this one wild plant. For cabbage, we um, we selected for like really large leaves. For Brussels sprouts, we tried to select for the buds on like the stalk. And over time, these traits became super exaggerated to the point where none of these artificially selected vegetables look remotely like each other. So Darwin argued that this same process occurs in nature just without human interference. So he observed two things. Members of a population vary in their inherited traits. So a population naturally has a bunch of different kinds of traits. A wild mustard is just, um, it's like, I don't, it's like, you can search it out. It's just like a, it's like sort of weedy looking plant with like small flowers. Um, so he had two observations. Members of a population vary in their inherited traits. So they naturally have lots of different traits within them. And all species produce more offspring than their environment can support. And many of these offspring fail to survive and reproduce. So. The inferences he drew from this were that individuals who naturally had inherited traits given to them had a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a certain environment 
tended to leave more offspring than others. So because of like the over reproduction, there were like so many different traits, but only the ones that had the favorable traits were able to survive. So this unequal ability to reproduce led to the accumulation of favorable traits over generations. So um, the concept of over reproduction. So um, yeah, I think this is where we talked up to. So I think we're good up to there. Okay, so um, so you don't understand how populations are affected by natural selection and not individuals. Okay, so an individual doesn't get to choose what kind of traits they pass on or what kind of traits they are given. So it's not so much an individual aspires to survive better in their environment, it's just as a whole, the individuals that do better survive better and create their offspring. So from an individual standpoint, it's not really that pronounced because either they just don't reproduce or they reproduce. But from a population, you can see the trend based on environmental changes that a certain trait is more favorable in that environment. Does that make sense? I think it was Resor that asked this question. Okay, great. Um, does anyone have any last questions before we sign off for today? Okay, great. So um, you can leave now if you want. Um, yeah, no problem. Have a nice day.